Anyway, it's a pleasure to welcome our, the last speaker of our uh, session here, uh, Tony St. Ledger. Um, I've known Tony since uh, he was a graduate student in uh, Robert Hendrick's lab at University of Pittsburgh. Uh, he passed up coming to my lab for a postdoc and instead went to Rachel Caspi's lab at the National Eye Institute. But give him credit, he's done quite well. A beautiful paper out in, in, in immunity, which is probably the most convincing uh, story that, that I've seen anyway, um, showing a role for commensals and the microbiome uh, in the eye, albeit in the conjunctiva. Anyway, after uh, Tony managed to get a, a K99, uh, the so-called kangaroo grant, and he just started uh, his position at the University of Pittsburgh uh, as an assistant professor, so he is one of the young stars in our group. And welcome, thank you. Thank you, Eric, for the introduction. Uh, I thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present some of my work. So today I'm going to give a brief overview of what we published in Immunity. Then I'll talk about some stuff I'm still finishing up at, at NIH in collaboration with Rachel Casby. And then I can sort of whet your appetite with some of my stuff I've started in my short time at Pitt so far. So I work with mucosal tissue at the ocular surface, and that's composed of multiple parts, like the lacrimal gland, the lacrimal duct, which drains the tears. But my tissue of interest currently is um, the conjunctiva. And being many uh, ophthalmologists in the field, we know that, in the audience, we know that the conjunctiva is a thin mucosal tissue that attaches to the peripheral cornea, goes around, and um, attaches to the eye. But Animal studies and human studies have shown that within this uh, mucosal tissue, there's actually all the ingredients required for a conventional mucosal immune response. There's adaptive and innate lymphocytes, there's M cells to process antigen, um, there's lymphoid follicles, and we all know that um, IgA is secreted in the tears and is the main protective antibody of the ocular surface. So if we compare the cells we see at the, in the conjunctiva to a conventional mucosal immune tissue like the intestine, you see that all, all the cells are there. The M cells, the innate and adaptive cells, you have uh, goblet cells producing mucus. However, it's well known in the intestine that you need commensal bacteria to appropriately tune that immune response to help prevent infectious disease as well as prevent autoimmunity. However, at the ocular surface, the thought was not the case. The ocular surface was, is conventionally thought to be sterile. And if you're looking at the central cornea, I would agree with you that if you take a swab of the central cornea, you're not going to get any bacteria or very little, if any. Um, also, uh, because of the constant tear washing, the lysozyme, antimicrobial peptides, and IgA, again, it's not a very hospitable environment for bacteria. However, if you go underneath the eyelid and start taking samples of, of the conjunctiva and doing uh, advanced PCR analysis, you can see that bacterial signatures are actually starting to form between ethnic groups, geographic groups, as well as, as, well as people that wear contact lenses or don't wear contact lenses. However, finding DNA evidence, as, as Katrina showed, as explained, doesn't tell us anything. Are these bacteria alive? Is this DNA that has been there for, for a while or has just flown there from the environment? So we decided to ask if there are bacteria in the conjunctiva. And we use a mouse model because getting enough human specimens and to do functional analysis was impossible for us. So we started off the complicated way using a 16S uh, gene sequencing analysis, and we found that there was a very limited diversity of bacteria at the ocular surface. This con confirmed to us that we're probably not getting any sort of contamination from the gut. We had a very limited diversity. And if we look, we see staphylococci, which is known to be there. We see crini bacteria, which are known to be there, as well as various other commensal and pathogenic bacteria. But again, we found DNA. This doesn't tell us whether these are alive. So we decided to just take bulk conjunctival homogenates and plate them on auger plates. And we found a very interesting candidate. And I could tell you um, the serendipitous nature of this finding, maybe at the poster session. I don't really have time to explain it now. But what we found was Carinibacterium mastidides actually grow, grew out of the conjunctival tissue. And when we sequenced this bug, interestingly, and connected to human studies, is the isolate was actually very s similar to an isolate found in the conjunctiva of a nine-year-old boy that was published many years ago. 
Further, um, another um, case to make it a little more translatable is that this bug is specific to genomycin, which is a common antibiotic prescribed for ocular surface disease. So it does have a little bit of translatability. But again, we didn't know if this bug had just landed there or just land, uh, was inoculated by a mouse scratching its eye. So we decided to do fluorescence in situ hybridization to look for Crinibacterium, the, the genus. And what we found in our mice that were bred in our facility, you start to see that it's actually very abundant in the conjunctival tissue. We see the lighting up. And we actually see filaments start to form in the tissue, suggesting that this bug is actually dug into the tissue and not just flying there or just being introduced there right before the assay. What was, again, serendipitous to my project was that we started, started to assay mice from different commercial vendors. And what we found was the bug was not present in those. In Jackson Laboratories, we looked at Taconic and Charles River as well. So this gave us a nice um, model to start to test causality. So the first thing we did to look to see if this bacteria actually mattered was we tossed on some gent gentamicin onto the ocular surface, a typical regimen of once a day for six days. And we collaborated with Mihalis leonacus at, at NIAD, and we used um, a candida albicans infection, so a fungal infection as, as sort of our, our infectious model. And we did this mostly out of, because his lab was upstairs and we were uh, very good collaborators already. And what we found in vitro was that if we isolated tears from wild-type mice or wild-type mice that were treated with antibiotics, we see that tears from wild-type antibiotic-treated mice actually were poorer at killing fungus in vitro. But this was an in vitro assay, what happens in vivo? And when we look in vivo, we actually saw a very striking result, that, which is standard, that if you challenge wild-type mice with candida albicans, they're naturally resistant. So we see that the cornea, after 36 hours, remains smooth and glassy and clear. And if we do a PAS stain of, of, the, of the cornea, we see that maybe there's one fungal filament, but no real overt disease. However, if we look at the wild-type antibiotic treated mice, we see that textures start to form in the cornea, and we start to see, notice some uh, pretty serious pathology. And you can start to see the, f the fungal filaments actually penetrate through the corneal epithelia down into the stroma. And we used uh, immune-deficient mice as nice controls. You can see that the cornea is essentially destroyed. We confirmed our result using qPCR in collaboration with Mihalis' lab to show that, yes, indeed, if you disrupt the microbiome at the ocular surface, you're going to leave yourself more susceptible to this fungal challenge. But this didn't establish a causal link. So we, we noticed that if you take the bug away or take all of the bugs away, you see this response. We had to show that we can add this bug back and see a phenotype. So we had a very simple inoculation scheme for um, inoculating vendor mice with CMAS. So I told you that uh, vendor mice were CMAS negative earlier. So we gently dried um, the tear film uh, once every three days um, for a total of three treatments and then applied some CMAS to the ocular surface. We then waited up five weeks. We've taken out to eight or 10 weeks. And we looked at CFU by eye swab of the conjunctiva. And what we found was that CMAS was still there in the conjunctival tissue well after our last inoculation. This told us that the bug wasn't just washed away, it, it stayed there and dug into the tissue. We, interestingly, we tried other Carinibacterium uh, species as well as Staph epidermidis, and we saw that that doesn't hang around very well. So CMAST, that told us that CMAST is a unique colonizer of the eye and has some sort, something special about it that lets it stay around. Interestingly, if we co-house uh, a mouse that's not um, CMAS positive with a mouse that is CMAS positive, a typical way to sort of um, get the microbi microbiota mingling, we don't see that the bug transfers to any of these CMAS negative mice. So it's not a horizontal transfer. But if we use this mouse as a breeder and um, we look at all of her pups, every one of her pups in subsequent generations has CMAS in the ocular tissue. So this supports the notion that this is a resident commensal that is uh, colonizing the tissue and is present. And you can see from our fish staining the confirmation of this. Finally, we challenged mice with fungus as well as bacteria to see if CMAST was imposing a beneficial immunity. And that's exactly what we see. So we look at our uh, fungal genome copies and we see significant reductions in the fungi colonized, uh, 
infecting the tissue um, whenever CMAST is present. We collaborated with Mihaela Gedhiva at Brigham and Women's, who uses a Pseudomonas aeruginosa infect infection model, and we again saw a similar reduction in, in bacterial burden as well as pathology score. And this was um, actually performed in her laboratory in Boston, so this was a nice confirmation for us that our phenotype just isn't because it's NIH. We see that it also crosses institution uh, borders. So this let us establish sort of a causal relationship between crinibacterium acididies um, with infectious uh, ocular disease. So I won't get into the granular details of this interaction now, but what we found was that antigen-presenting cells in the tissue stimulate gamma-delta T cells to protect the ocular <coughs> surface. And my lab currently is very interested in these gamma-delta T cells, and I feel like uh, being some cl clinicians out there, these gamma-delta T cells should be uh, pretty important to be looked at, especially in the ocular tissue. Gamma-delta T cells are, are not conventional alpha-beta T cells that normally develop after birth. Gamma-delta T cells develop, uh, are fetal-derived, and they seed barrier tissues like the conjunctiva very early, um, before birth and after birth. But interestingly, up to 50% of the conjunctival lymphocytes are actually gamma-delta T cells in both humans, and, what, and I found that in mice. And gamma-deltas are linked to infectious disease, wound healing, and autoimmunity at the ocular surface. So the jury's still out whether, I guess, in certain situations they can be beneficial or pathogenic. But what we found when we challenged mice with CMAS, so we inoculated them um, conventionally, we see that wild-type mice, again, there's no phenotype because this bug is beneficial in the normal steady-state conditions. However, if we inoculate RAG2 deficient mice, so these mice have no T cells, no B cells, they start to develop a keratitis in the ocular tissue. If we look at just gamma-delta T cell knockout, so this is a mouse that has no gamma-deltas, we see that they also develop a keratitis and have an inability to control bacteria in the, in the ocular tissue. And I think this is interesting because if you look in the literature, crinibacterium species are commonly linked to, to in eye infections in the elderly. And talking to some of our clinicians at Pitt, they basically push crinibacterium species off as a standard commensal that, again, they just toss away. They don't link it to the actual disease. However, you can imagine that as your immune system starts to deteriorate over time, and perhaps maybe your gamma delta T cells aren't as effective, maybe that gives crinibacterium an avenue to stop being a commensal and start being a, a pathobiont. So we're now asking the question, can we achieve a better understanding of gamma-delta T cells functionality to alleviate ocular surface disease? So independently of that, we're also looking at manipulating all of these relationships to see how we can um, swing disease, a disease state. And before I left NIH, we started collaborating with Warren Strober and Ivan Fuss looking at this IL-1 beta and gamma-delta T cell reaction, uh, interaction. And instead of using an infectious model, we're using an auto-inflammatory model, specifically Muckle-Well syndrome, which is pathology associated with the overproduction of IL-1 beta. It's caused by a genetic mutation in the NLRP3 inflammasome, and um, primary manifestations of this disease in humans are in the uh, skin, joints, and especially the ocular mucosa that you can see here. So the effect that Warren and Ivan showed was primarily mediated through APCs and TH17 cells. And there are effective therapies like anakinra, which is an IL-1 beta blockade, but we still don't quite know why ocular disease actually manifests. Um, so we ask, can ocular surface disease be due to an aberrant response to commensals? So this is some background from Warren and Ivan's original paper linking commensal bacteria in the skin to spontaneous dermatitis in a Muckle-Wells model, um, mouse model of disease. So these mice have a homologous mutation that's seen in humans. And you can see that the muckle wells mice develop spontaneous inflammation that's then um, alleviated whenever you treat with systemic antibiotics. So we came up with a hypothesis that this is probably a systemic response. So we induced DSS colitis in these mice, and we see that colitis is actually more severe in muckle wells syndrome mice, but we saw no eye phenotype. So this told us that it's probably not some dissemination of gut microbes causing ocular surface disease. So we asked the question, can commensals at the ocular surface actually um, be causing this disease? And we first looked at a spontaneous model of, of the mouse strain. So you can see muckle wells, uh, wild type compared to muckle wells. And these muckle wells mice develop the spontaneous dermatitis. 
And you can see from the eye-draining lymph nodes, their lymph nodes are huge, gigantic, some of the biggest I've ever seen in a mouse. Um, if we look at the ocular tissue as well as the eye-draining lymph nodes at gamma delta T cells, we see that there's a lot of IL-17 produced by these cells, which we're hypothesizing as pathogenic in this model. Similarly, if we look at neutrophils as a function of I as a measurement of IL-17 functionality, we see that neutrophils are significantly increased. Now, this is a spontaneous model. We have no idea if CMAST is actually present. But the problem is we could never actually attribute causality because these mice develop dermatitis so frequently. So if you back cross this mouse strain to the uh, white uh, Balpsy background, they actually don't develop spontaneous inflammation. So this allowed us to actually test causal relationship. So if we inoculate wild type mice and muckle wells mice with Carinibacterium mastitides, you can see that, that um, a fraction of them start to develop this really severe conjunctival uh, phenotype. And we can actually see this phenotype occur three weeks after that final inoculation if we compare neutrophil numbers in the conjunctiva. So without CMAS, there's no, really no difference. However, if you add CMAS, we see this a slight increase in neutrophils that's usually non-pathogenic, but we see a significant increase in neutrophils over uh, the wild-type control. This suggested to us that, that CMAS can cause this phenotype. As confirmation, we looked at gamma delta T cell activation. Um, we see that they're significantly increased in the draining lymph nodes. And we also see an increase in IL-17, again, supporting our thought that these gamma delta T cells are actually very overactive. So we next tried to get a little bit of a mechanistic detail, what's actually going on here. So we performed a simple <coughs> mixing experiment. So we, we got um, antigen-presenting cells from wild-type or muckle wells mice and we co-incubated them with CMAST and gamma delta T cells from wild type or muckle wells mice. And the conclusions from this are a little bit complicated, so I'll walk you through it, uh, but we're seeing a very interesting phenotype in these mice. So if you compare wild type cells that are stimulated with wild type DCs or antigen presenting cells or muckle wells antigen presenting cells, we see a huge increase in IL-17 production, suggesting that antigen presenting cells or gamma delta T cell extrinsic factors are in play. So this is what the literature has stated. However, if we compare wild type gamma delta T cells and muckle wells gamma delta T cells stimulated by the same antigen presenting cell, we're still seeing about two to three-fold more IL-17 produced, suggesting that there's a gamma delta T cell intrinsic, so, so there's an inflammasome property within these gamma delta T cells that could perpetuate the problem. And you can see from the flow cytometry, comparing these frequencies, that um, the flow is very, is very convincing in my eyes. So we actually look for inflammasome components in these gamma delta T cells to see if this could be a factor. So when we perform mRNA analysis of components of the inflammasome, caspase-1 and ASC, we see that muckle wells gamma delta T cells actually have more inflammasome components compared to the wild-type control. If we look at pro-caspase-1, so the un, it's an inactive form of caspase-1, we see that muckle wells gamma deltas always have more of, of the component compared to the wild-type control. But functionally, we did a functional assay using this FLICA, which which measures active caspase-1 activity, we see that the muckle wells gamma delta T cells has a higher MFI, so it's cleaving this reagent much more effectively than the wild-type control. And this is similar to some studies done in NIH looking at uh, CD4 inflammasome activity as well. And um, you can see the quantification here. So with this, this part, we, we are trying to say that over active inflammasome activity could increase susceptibility to pathology associated with IL-17 gamma delta T cells. And there might be a meaningful intrinsic inflammasome role in the gamma delta T cell compartment. And in certain situations, CMAST, which is usually non-pathogenic, can actually trigger uh, the inflammasome and become a pathobiont in muckle wells syndrome. So in the last few minutes, I'd like to go over um, the, the animal model of HSV, which I'm working with at, at Pitt, and I'll just very quickly go over it, where HSV, um, it can cause blindness in, in humans and cause uh, blinding keratitis. And it, when we infect, it starts to replicate in the cornea epithelia, gain access to axons innervating the cornea. It can then travel through retrograde axonal transport back to the trigeminal ganglia where it goes latent. And periodically, it'll reactivate, get delivered back to the ocular surface, causing disease. 
So there's two places of viral control at the surface before infection. You can push it away before it has a chance to infect, or you can control it back in the trigeminal ganglia. Currently, I'm focused with the acute phase, so within, several, within a few days, trying to eliminate virus from the cornea early. And the reason why this is kind, is kind of important is because neonatal HSV is actually a very severe disease. So 45% of neonatal HSV um, is associated with skin, eye, or mouth disease. So basically cold sores in the skin or the mouth or eye. However, 30% of them have CNS involvement and 25% actually have disseminated disease. Both of these could end up in death or lasting uh, damage. So we're trying to figure out how to, especially in neonates, um, reduce disease. And some very, very preliminary data um, we see here, uh, we're trying to link CMAST to viral protection. Um, so our experimental setup is that we inoculate mice with CMAST as normal, we infect with HSV, and look very early after infection to see if there's any differences. And the differences are striking. So if we look at two days post-infection, so basically the virus is replicating in the, in the corneal epithelia, and we do a fluorazine stain, you can see that there's very nice green suggesting that there's epithelial damage. However, in mice that have CMAST, you don't see such an intense stain. You maybe see some at the periphery, but there's really not anything in the cornea. That doesn't mean these mice are not infected, because at six days post-infection, you start to see some ocular swelling. However, if we look in the cornea for monocytes, we see that there's a significant reduction in monocytes whenever mice are colonized with CMAST compared to the HSV-only controls. Well, then, if we look even further and we start to see whenever the acute phase of the response starts to calm down, you could see that mice simply inoculated, infected with HSV-1 actually have a very severe skin disease phenotype, which is alleviated very quickly in HSV plus CMAST mice. So this suggests to us that somehow CMAST is imposing some sort of benefit at the ocular surface, not only in fungal and bacterial infections, but also viral infections. So this is an area of active research that we're uh, performing right now in the lab. So with that, I can um, thank the people in my lab. So we have a few postdocs now, and I inherited actually Bob Hendricks's people, who uh, has an Im uh, impending retirement in July. We also have Flowcore um, and our collaborators, Kip Kingington and Ben Treat, as well as my funding. So then I could take any questions. So in regards to neutrophils producing IL-1 beta, we haven't looked at those. So CMAST in particular, I, a lot of the sequencing data haven't, haven't gone that deep. So I think between 50 and 60% of humans have Carinibacterium as a genus in the ocular tissue. Whether that's mastididies, we're not sure. Um, but again, our pathologists at, at Pitt have said that from corneal scrapings, whenever people have disease, they always find there's a lot of crini bacteria in there, but they push it off as some, as I think they're technically, it's a non-diphtheroid crini bacteria or something, which they say is a normal commensal. So, but it could be causing a lot of that pathology. So in the skin specifically, um, so Yasmin Belke to show the Kearney bacterium in the skin is usually Kearney bacterium acolins, not mastidides, they haven't found it. Um, in regards to the, the mice, I think actually Kearney bacterium is probably more prevalent in universities as opposed to vendors. And I think we need to start taking that into consideration that vendor mice are very clean. So we had mice shipped from Wash U and St. Louis uh, to do some other experiments with collaborators and they had it and they came into our animal facility and mice in our animal facility had it. So potential criticism was that, oh, this is just unique to NIH. I think the Jackson phenotype is unique to vendors is how I, I would say it, not necessarily the other way around. Way around. So we do, we do know that um, so there are CD8s and CD4s that get stimulated by it, and they don't, they don't traffic to the, the, to the con specifically, because we haven't seen a real boosted alpha beta T cell response there. We haven't looked at whether we're getting an expansion of HSV specific cells very early. I think it's, it's very possible that 
that the bacteria almost acts as an adjuvant at the point of infection almost. You have this smoldering inflammation that whenever you get this bug that the immune system can go into overdrive much more quickly than if it's a sterile environment. And in regards to your comment about the bacteria, so what's interesting, whenever we have our mice start to develop a lot of skin disease, the diversity of bacteria goes through the roof. So in asymptomatic mice or mice that aren't infected with HSV, we see only crany bacteria there whenever we colonize them. But when we infect them with HSV, you'll get a bunch of other bugs that pop up. And I think it's probably because you're opening up a skin, skin niche that, that crany bacterium can overcome. Right. Yeah. Great. Very nice talk. Thank you. Thank you.